morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 453, yes, of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Shadoop, 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 yeah, yeah. Today, recording day is Wednesday. August 22nd, 2024, and it still looks like it's going to be a bit of a gray day here at the Beaver Lodge, at least to start off. Uh, The sun made an effort yesterday, popped up uh, for a little bit, but then it was pretty much gray and wet over and over and over again (laughs) yesterday. I am your host, the eager beaver pronouns, he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, and with me as always is Mr. Grizzly, no longer orange. (laughs) because <laughs> in the, the pre-show Mr. Grizzly was uh, trying to fix his lights because uh, for some reason the spirit of Trump had invaded dun, dun, dun. a big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing and CanadianTarot.com before we get on with the show Mr. Grizzly, how is your mental health today sir? Well sir, good morning uh, mental health wise um Jury's still out on that. I'm a little groggy. I went to bed early, but just not fully awake. And I'm only on my first cup of coffee and realized I didn't make any more. So I'm going to have to get up at some point and make some <gasps> coffee because one cup of coffee is not going to be able to cut it. And I think even Lola's feeling uh, in the doldrums. It's just, This is day six of waking up with nothing but rain and cloud. And she's not, she didn't crawl. Normally she crawls into my room and gives her shake and sort of wakes me up at about 530 and then lies down and cuddles with me. This morning, she didn't do that until five to six. Mm. And then I got up and she just stayed there (laughs) Mm. and then went and crawled onto the couch. Hasn't been hounding me to take her out yet. Pardon the pun hound because she's a dog, but But literally, uh, normally she's like a year ago, not this morning. So I think the, the weather's been getting to her too. Cause last, last night she was just, I don't know, all over the map. So yeah, it's this uh, day six of overcast and rain it's supposed to be uh, sunny later today hopefully hopefully it gets nice today because i i just i'm really at my wits end with this weather right now <laughs> yeah yeah this is yeah it's it, it, it's but i personally don't mind gray days mm-hmm. too many usually gray up. days are slightly windy and i like mm-hmm. wind which is the whole reason i have like long hair because i like wind in my hair but yeah. Do. Oh wait, no. <laughs> but yeah, like it, it, like everything, right? You know, uh, as much as I like lasagna, uh, if I am to say, if I, if I turn around and say I like lasagna so much, I could eat it every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, yeah, after about two days, I had enough. Yeah. So same thing with the gray days. Just like, eh, well, let's mix it up a little bit, please. <laughs> All right, kids and cubs. Well. Um, 
lots is happening. The biggest thing that is happening, of course, right now, uh, particularly for Canada, is that we are in the middle of a strike. Yeah, uh, well, in the middle, at the start. Yes. Yeah, CN, uh, no, CPKC locked out their employees and CN, they're on strike. I think that's how it is. Or is it the other way around? I think it's the other way around. I think C, CPK, CPKC, uh, their uh, union had handed them a 72-hour strike notice on Monday mm-hmm. and CN is locking them out. Yeah, I knew it was uh, one, one or the other. I just couldn't remember which one. Yeah. So, I, have a, I have a clip for you later on. We'll show you of irony amongst irony that's nothing to do with the strike something to do with something else altogether that cassie sent me that when you see this you're gonna you're gonna just go irony is dead okay so we'll get okay. to it in a little bit i just wanted to drop that little tidbit in there for well, i'll bring it up a little bit later on mr grizzly showing some leg well when you see this video you're gonna be like, <laughs> yeah we know we told you that oh okay two years ago Okay. 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 It's going to be one of those things. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So, uh, yeah, 12 1 AM came and went and, uh, there was no deal whatsoever. Um, labor minister, Stephen McKinnon, uh, yesterday said that, um, the stakes are high Canadians mm-hmm. are counting on them. Commuters are counting on the farmers. Uh, counting on them. The farmers are counting on them. These people need to understand very, very clearly that it is their duty to get a deal. Their duty to get a deal. Um, the two rail companies involved say that they're, um, they've made, they made some offers before the deadline that uh, were not accepted. Um, and uh, of course, you know, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, some people have uh, made some diversions to uh, try to run things by truck, uh, but there's only so much you can do when it comes to that uh, because there aren't really many alternatives, particularly for farmers. Um, they need the railways and they need the ports. And, uh, you know, if the rail shipments stop coming, then eventually it does affect the ports Mm -hmm. well another uh so you know there will be knock-on effects um canadian national and canadian pacific kansas city have been winding down operations ahead of a possible shutdown as we mentioned before they've stopped picking up some loads to make sure perishable goods like meat and medicine aren't stranded also things like things that might be explosive uh aren't stranded so uh, there's been a gradual sort of um closing down of stuff over the, the last little bit um, John Corey, who represents some of the companies that rely on the railway, say that if trains stop for more than a few days, the domino effects, uh, the domino effect will, like I mentioned, affect ports, uh, can bring imports and exports to a standstill. They say um, ports should be start feeling things um, in about two days. That's where yeah. Things are gonna, um, yeah. I had an interesting conversation last night with a friend about... Uh, He's like, ah, oh, these bloody unions shutting down the thing. I go, well, one of them's going on strike and the other one's been locked out by the employer. And I said, you'd have to understand what these employers, when it comes to rails, the, the thing that the union's going on strike for is, uh, yes, better wages, but also better safety concerns. And the union is really strong about safety concerns. I said, Lack Meganetic happened because they cut staff to check and verify breaks on systems because they didn't feel like paying them. And I go and look at People died. A town was destroyed as a result of that. And he was like, yeah, you're right. And then I told him a story about how, because I was never in a union, I have actually been told by management to break the law, do something that would put my life in jeopardy or get sent home. I said, that doesn't happen under unions. And I gave him a story about that. He goes, you're right. I go, I know, I know that you have a hate on for unions because you, like many people of your generation, feel all they did was get greedy, and, 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 and they did. There were unions who had too much power, just like any monopoly has too much power. Mm-hmm. So in this instance, this is to provide for better wages for their employees and better safety standards, more than anything else. And we came to a complete agreement about that, which I was not expecting, but he, he's, well, he's, he's an intelligent individual. And, and he mm-hmm. says, you know what? You're absolutely right. When it comes to safety, you, you don't cut corners because 
people die. He says, deregulation was bad. Mm. I said, look what it did to the airline industry. And you know who's responsible for deregulation of the airline industry? You're going to be surprised when I tell you this. Okay. You know who signed it? Mm. Jimmy Carter. Ooh. Yeah. Watched the documentary about it the other day. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, wait, he, he brought it in. Well, I don't think he signed it, but I don't think he was a big supporter there of it. He was the president at the time and that's just the way it went. Uh, but yeah. And deregulation of the airline, we thought this will bring prices down. No, no, it didn't. It cut safety concerns and drew, drove profits up and cut quality and blah, 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 blah. And basically deregulation of the airline industry is what destroyed Pan Am. Pan Am mm. needed regulation to stay in, uh, afloat. It's just funny. I watched a really good documentary about it, and it, it really does break down how deregulation in the long run is never good for the public at large. Oh, no. no. Never. 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 Because what get, once it's deregulated, they, they're supposed to self-regulate. So, yeah, we'll take care. And, and how do you hear this? Every time. This every has never time. worked. Every Voluntary measures time. do not work. No, but, but every single time there's an the accident. To the Every single itself. time. It never works. There's an accident or a mishap or an airline crash or a derail. Safety is our number one priority. No, it isn't. Yes. Priority, pro- profit is their number one priority. They say safety is their number one priority, but they're not willing to spend the money on That's it because the stance, yeah. it cuts into their profit margin. Yeah. Profit is their number one priority. Yeah. Shareholder margin is their number one pri- yes. priority, period. That's all it is yes. to it. And they cut safety... Uh, regulations because well we'll self-regulate so if Don't safety worry. was your number one priority because like we'll look like a magnetic mm-hmm. right um your safety track record would prove that and that was not the case of like Megantic. the rail companies there did not have a very good safety, which made which made the decision by the harper government to accept the deregulation that would reduce the number of employees from two to one mm-hmm this incomprehensible because it was a rail line company that had one of the worst safety records. Period. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. It's like, Ken, I know it's pee on my leg. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I can tell the difference between clear and yellow. Thank you. <sighs> but yes, um, basically, um, we're going to have, we, but potentially we'll have a major coast to coast supply chain, well, coast to coast to coast supply mm-hmm. chain that is cut. Analytics firm Moody's estimates every day of the shutdown could cost the economy $341 million. Business groups, of course, say it's time for the federal government to step in to use binding arbitration to resu- resolve the dispute. Um, no. no. No, it's not for the government to do your job for you. All right. Um, Labor Minister Stephen McKinnon insists that that's not in the cards. This government believes in collective bargaining. Uh, collective bargaining is tried and true method after, so he basically, that's a quote. This government believes in collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is tried and true method. And he met with the companies uh, and the union in Montreal and in Calgary. Mm-hmm. And then says that after nine months of talks, they need to get a deal done today. Quote, this is obviously not a pace of progress that is acceptable to Canadians in such a sensitive industry. Yeah, I don't say. So far, the negotiations have been tense. This is according to CBC, and all signs seem far apart. That's what the unions say specifically. Uh, companies say they're ready to lock out nearly 10,000 workers. Um, CN Rail Director Jonathan Abacassis is uh, doing the framing thing, putting uh, the unions uh, as the bad guys, quote, Supply chains and the Canadian economy are being held hostage because the union hasn't wanted to actually meaningfully engage with us, but they don't yet agree on issues of wages and safety. And for that, workers are willing to strike. Uh, No CN Rail Director Jonathan Abacassis. Supply chains and the Canadian economy are being held hostage because your company, after changing, asking for a one-year delay in 2002 in order to accommodate fatigue, provisions are now in a situation where both rail companies can strike at the same time and you have decided to schedule your lockout to coincide with a 72-hour strike notice mm-hmm. thus reducing options because you could have decided that your move to lock people out would happen 
after the staff and the corporation with CK, CPKC reached their agreement and then move on to yours so that the over so that the business could go to the other way. You could actually be making additional business if you had extra cars taking on the extra, but you chose to create a situation where everything shuts down in order to create more pressure on the government because the government's going to be hearing from miners and agriculture, uh, the agriculture industry and all these other industries, hey, we're suffering collateral damage. Get in there and make stuff happen mm -hmm. so that you don't have to do your work. Effectively. Don't, do not blame the unions. This is you. You had a choice as to when it is you were going to lock out. You chose to time it simultaneously. So that's not the union keeping people, holding people hostage in the industry hostage. That is you. Exactly. You, specifically. Let's put the responsibility where it lies. You had choices. It didn't have to be today. That was strategy. Because your first priority is not clearly the economy. Your first priority is try to find a way to not pay your workers what they're worth. Exactly. And to not, to, to not give them the basic safety provisions. Well, the, this they are asking for and work-life balance. This one here from Playing with 3D. If more profits are desired, a simple solution would be to stop paying one CEO the same amount as ninety percent of the workforce. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, uh, Christopher Minette, who's speaking for the union, uh, quote: "They're rolling in billions of dollars a year after year of profits. It's not up to us to be looking to lower working conditions when they're so profitable." So. Um, <laughs> and it's true. They're right. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely right. Um, so here with, um, as well, what else do I have here? Um, so it seems that now, um, people are starting to do some of that negotiating in public once it starts. So, you know, making those statements, trying to paint each other as the bad guy. Uh, CN said it made a final attempt to avoid this with an offer at the bargaining table in Montreal last night and says its offer would have improved wages, but the union did not respond, uh, despite its efforts to negotiate in good faith. Of course, because the corporation always negotiates in good faith. Yes, They're always. Just, every single They're day. usually proactive at that. Yes, yes, totally. Yes. Uh, CN accused the Teamsters of not showing any urgency or desire to reach a deal that's good for, ev for everyone from the bargaining table. CP Casey also said it presented an enhanced, enhanced final offer to avoid and said that it was offering wage increases that exceeded inflation and yet it said a negotiating outcome is not within reach because the teamsters continue to make unrealistic demands the union says it's heading to the picket lines this morning and that the sides remain far apart it blames the railways for this work stoppage saying none of their offers were seriously considered so none of the union's offers to mm -hmm. um to the the companies were seriously considered by either company the union president, Paul Bouchard, said the railways are showing themselves willing to compromise rail safety and tear families apart to earn an extra buck. Yep. He says the companies are trying to weak, weaken worker protections around rest periods, and in CN's case, also force employees to relocate. Railways have been, ask, railways have been asking for binding arbitration as far back as June. Mm. So, um, yeah. Uh, so they really didn't want to do the work at all. They've been of asking, not. They, they've been asking for months for the government to come and save them, do the work for them. Uh, the federal minister has been reluctant to agree to that, but now we have a work stoppage. What's the government going to do? Stephen McKinnon uh, was on Power and Politics last night. He, he said he was not prepared to, to tip his hand about giving up on negotiations or sending this for binding arbitration or forcing workers back in the meantime. Quote, I'm not going to get into the what ifs if parties have to understand that Canadians are counting on them and it's their duty to get a deal. Uh, CPKC said it was proceeding with a lockout now to avoid having even more widespread disruption in the fall of peak shipping. So I'm guessing that uh, um, even though the union presented a 72 hour strike notice and now that they're in a legal strike position, uh, CPKC is probably locking out a little broad, more broader, mm -hmm. more broadly. That's my, my interpretation. Um, I'm it's not stated as a fact here specifically. So and this is sort of the best interpretation I can figure out based on well, what's written in the story here. Um, so yes, they're proceeding with a lockout now to avoid having even more widespread disruption in the fall peak shipping for spring crops, for example. But it also means that it's happening when parliament isn't sitting to pass back to work legislation as well. 
So uh, this puts the government in a very interesting position because if everybody's calling for back-to-work legislation, then that means Parliament needs to be recalled early. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that the government is very, very much not inclined to be doing that right now. Mm. No, because uh, all MPs, right, it's not a partisan thing, use this part of the year to go out and reach to constituents. Yes. So if they come back early, all the party's strategies for actually reaching out and talking to Canadians, figuring out what their needs and their priorities are so they can bring that back to the House this fall, all that gets cut short. So, and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, as we mentioned, being an MP, whether you like the MP or not, and being staffers of MPs, is very, 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 very tough work. It's 24-7, it's long days. A lot of people, because Canada's a big country, are far away from their families. This is time that's important. If you want well-balanced, happy politicians who do good work, they need time with their families. They need time in their constituency. Mm -hmm. Yes, this would get in the way of that. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, Finance Minister Christian Freeland, however, has been uh, using some, making statements like, you know, we can't sabotage ourselves and we can't cr cause self-harm. So there might, that might be a way from somebody who is not the Labour Minister to send a message that, yes, we are willing to wait, but um, maybe not that long. Time will tell. Well, you know, the uh, inflation is down, interest is going down, GDP, as we mentioned yesterday, is starting to go up. We went from 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 to 1.5 quarter to quarter to quarter. The 1.5 is still an estimate based on a, like a Canada estimates, not yet confirmed. Um, this will definitely cause a dent. Oh, yes. Right? So, and, you know, the, the liberals would like a good news story. They would like to have continued, repeated good news stories on GDP all the way till the election next year, uninterrupted, if possible, to try and create this drumbeat of no, we are managing things well. <clears throat> so this could get in the way of that. Um, this is the first ever simultaneous work stoppage between both companies. The Railway Association of Canada says the shutdown halts about one billion dollars in goods goods traffic each day. Um, Let's see, so yes, yeah, CN says they formally locked out workers. I'm just go, scrolling through an article here. Uh, to, to, to. So uh, the Teamsters Canada Rail Conference said in a statement, this is from City News, that despite months of good faith negotiations, quote, parties remain far apart and both CN and CPKC have begun their employer-driven work stoppage. Over the past several days, the Teamsters have put forward multiple offers, none of which were seriously considered. Quote, the main obstacles to reaching an agreement remain the company's demands, not union proposals. Early in the day, again, business groups pleaded for Ottawa to step in and prevent the work stoppage that would upend supply chains, while the Prime Minister stressed that a deal at the table is the best outcome. So even the Prime Minister has come out uh, and said not. He hasn't just left this to the Labour Minister. He's come out and actually made this statement himself as well. Um under the Canadian Labour Code, the federal Labour Minister can refer the dispute to the Canada Industrial Relations Board, CIRB, for binding arbitration and prohibit a strike or lockout in the interim business groups. Alternatively, they suggested the government recall Parliament and pass back-to-work legislation. This was a step that was taken by a previous Conservative government during the rail strike in 2012 and a move it threatened to make in 2015. Now, this doesn't only affect shipping. Um, Canadian Pacific, it also impacts commuter trains, for example. So Canadian Pacific barred virtually, pardon me, <clears throat> all new shipments on Tuesday morning. CN did the same to avoid leaving goods stranded on the tracks. Industries hit hardest by stoppage include agriculture, mining, energy, retail, automaking, and construction. So lots of industries will be affected. Um, more than 32,000 rail commuters also will have to find new routes to the office. Transit authorities have said select commuter lines that run on Can Canadian Pacific tracks in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver will be suspended should dispatchers walk off the job. 
the commuter lines affected by the work stoppage and are, tr are TransLink's West Coast Express in the Vancouver area, MetroLink's Milton Line and the Lakeshore Line's Hamilton GO Station in the Greater Toronto area, and EXO's Candiac, St. Jerome and Vaudreuil Hudson Lines in the Montreal area, among others. Quote, Please be advised that in the event of a work stoppage at the Canadian Pacific Kansas City potentially taking effect on August 22nd via rail mm -hmm. would unfortunately have to suspend trains 185 and 186 on its Sudbury White River service without alternative transportation until the issue is resolved. Impacted customers are being contacted directly to inform them of the situation. They can also autonomously modify the reservation or opt for a full refund at no cost online. Uh, retailers also worried about the ripple effects. Michelle Washelishan, spokesperson at the Retail Council of Canada, says, product is not being loaded onto various forms of transportation because of the expectation that it could just get backlogged and stuck. We're looking at holiday shopping products, Halloween products, and even food items. Um, so that's that bit. And then the last thing I had specifically with regard to um, Christian Friedland who had uh, mentioned some stuff here. Uh, this is from Global. Quote, it is, quote, entirely unacceptable for parties in a looming nationwide railway shutdown to risk sabotaging the Canadian economic progress, Finance Minister Christian Freeland says. Quote, it is entirely unacceptable for anyone to get in the way of that economic progress that we have all been making and that has been so hard fought and so hard won. She said Canadians expect the companies to negotiate in good faith, quote, your customers expect that, your customers' employees expect that, farmers expect that, Canada and Canadians expect that. We cannot tolerate a self-inflicted wound. So there you go. Um, putting have, a little pressure uh, there. I have and, a note, uh, uh, an article here from the Teamsters Rail. Okay. And uh, when was this? This is August 18th, but... <sighs> Citing railroads plan to change terms of contract, union plans to walk out, which we already know they did. CN sees no meaningful progress in negotiations. Uh, the TCRC, which is the Teamsters Canada Rail Conference, said it was issuing the strike notice after CPKC serve notice it would lock out the union members and change the terms of the collective agreements. We do not take this decision lightly, but CPKC's reckless actions have forced our hand by unilaterally locking out our members and changing the terms of the collective agreements, they are stripping our members of essential protections. We're serving strike notice to defend the rights and safety of our members. So, I mean, at the heart of it here, it really is uh, the safety factor more than anything else in this case. Because they just want to cut things so that they can increase their profit margin, increase shareholder dividend checks. And again, we will have another lack tick on our hands if that is allowed to to, to go forward. It, it it's, it's not... It's, it's a matter of if, it's when. Yes, exactly. That's exactly those were the words exactly I was gonna say, Mr. Grizzly. You're reading my mind. It's not if, it's when. Yep. And and yes, my goodness, they're going to get a, a wage increase because, you know, in case you haven't noticed, we have this thing called um inflation, which has been going on. Everything's mm -hmm. been going up. Like every time I go to the grocery store, I'm like, holy crap, I remember not that long ago when this was a lot less money. <laughs> Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, just talking to just talking to friends, you know, uh, who who um, they're all relatively well off, like upper middle class, and even they're saying they're cutting back on things because my buddy was telling me he goes, oftentimes, you know, on on a Thursday, I'd be tired, get home from the office, and I don't feel like cooking. I'll just go one of the, one of the delivery service for food. He says, the last time I checked, a simple meal that would cost me if I walked down to the fast food place. It would cost me $16, which isn't cheap, but it would cost me $16. He says, by the time the order comes in with tax, tip, and service charges, it was 40 bucks for the same thing. He's like, look, I can afford that, but on principle, no. No. And he says, and the other thing that bothers me, and it troubles me too, but I haven't seen it at this particular fast food outlet, is when you go to pay with your card and they give you the tip option. Mm. No, pay your goddamn employees. Mm. If you know, if you're in a coffee shop and that they turn, pour the coffee and hand it to you, and then there's a tip option. I'm sorry, I just don't have any more money to do this with. Our staff get have survived on tips, 
now they're actually earning the same minimum wage as everybody else because yes. that changed for decades they needed tips because yeah, they could not survive i never rules. understood that so well you get tips so you don't have to pay you as much yeah. no you pay people for the work tips are something the customer gives correct if they enjoyed the service it's like relying on something that someone may or may not give mm -hmm. to supplement your salary no 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 That's you wrong. get paid for the work yeah. It's um, just, it just it blows my mind that everybody wants a tip right now. And I'm like, ah, you know what? We got to get away from tipping culture. Yes. And I know people are upset by this, but no, we have to get away from it. Yep. Because why? We already we subsidize the salary when we buy the product or take the service. We already do. And in the end, it's just greed by the owner of the business who doesn't want to pay their employees a living wage. In the UK, it's all throughout Europe. Tips are very much an optional thing if you felt you've had an exceptional service. If you tip on every drink in the UK, they're like, what are you doing? They, they literally get offended by it. Hmm. I'm not poor. I'm paid a decent wage. I'm like, sorry. I've been told, no, if the, if the service is exceptional, on occasion, people will tip. Or, or will say, next one's on me. So you buy them a drink for the end of their, end of their shift. But it, it's just a completely different culture. And, and it is, it is destroying labor. It is destroying wages. It is destroying the working class and middle class's ability to, to become upwardly mobile and rise above. And the powers that be, the big corps that own things want to keep it the way it is because they're in control and they have all the power and all the money. Mm -hmm. I know I'm sounding like some sort of proletariat will rise up, and, but I'm not making this up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. It's all true. Yep. yep. Um, and if you're wondering about the ability to like shift stuff from rail to trucks, Stephen Laskowski, who's the president of the Canadian Trucking Alliance, says um, that one train is worth about 300 trucks. Wow. So it's not an easy transition. And again, for really large items, for really bulk items, large machinery, like example uh somebody's building a wind farm one of those propellers mm -hmm. uh, i mean i've seen them on a truck but i've seen them on trucks on the highway i've seen them here and when they but, transport them by truck uh, it's a big flatbed yep very big flatbed and usually a double trailer right yep. and they have escorts and they shut down they don't shut down the highway but they they severely limit the amount of traffic that can be on it at that time yeah so yeah so yeah a lot going on all right um the next thing uh we have to talk again uh about the decision by the ford government in ontario to uh, shut down the safe consumption sites mm -hmm. uh, i was reading up on it yesterday and it seems there was a time uh, around 2019 where they were referring them referring to them as overdose prevention centers and then they became safe consumption sites um i think the term overdose prevention center if we're talking about marketing and branding considering that the reason that this is being brought up is because doug ford is looking for an issue to run on right for an election issue that seems that he's doing stuff to protect you and you know tough on crime and doing it for the people and all that kind of stuff um Safe consumption says, well, we don't want people consuming drugs. Of course, nobody wants people consuming drugs. So an overdose prevention center seems like a term that's probably more accurate. Well, like this, and that would connect with the average person. Can I be super pedantic here for a moment? Hmm. We don't want people consuming drugs. Are you going to shut down the coffee shops? The LCBO, the beer stores, you're not going to sell ready-to-drink cocktails, beer, and wine in, in corner stores and gas stations. Uh, you're not going to sell cigarettes anymore because all of those things are drugs. Mm -hmm. All of them. Yep. So this is being hypocritical to the nth degree. Yep. We're going to shut down these drug dens because we don't want anybody using drugs. Make sure to stop by the 7-Eleven to get yourself a case of beer. Yeah. 
Now, um, there was something written by uh, Manisha Krishnan um, in the Toronto Star. Manisha Krishnan is an Emmy Award-winning journalist who covers drug policy. And I want to read this because this is very good and very well written. Um, basically, uh, people who write the, the things don't necessarily choose the headline, so I don't know if this was her headline or chosen for her, uh, but Doug Ford delivers a death sentence is the headline. Mm -hmm. It's been five months since Sudbury's only safe drug consumption site was forced to close due to a lack of funding, and former manager Amber Fritz is terrified of what happened to users of the space. Quote, a lot of people I used to see with regularity, I just don't see anymore, she told me. That's scary because I'm like, where are they? Are they still alive? Because it's a brutal fact that they may not be. Mm. Now, as Ontario Health Minister, allegedly, or health monster, Sylvia Jones announced Tuesday the government will be shutting down a swath of safe consumption sites, spaces where people can consume unregulated drugs under supervision and be revived if they overdose. Fritz's fears will be realized across a province that's already losing one person to a drug death every three hours. It's a nightmare, Fritz said. We're in the midst of a crisis and it's not being treated as such. Ontario currently has 17 provincially regulated safe drug consumption sites, but Jones says those within 200 meters of schools or daycare centers will be forced to close by March 31st, 2025. I was researching yesterday to try and find uh, if there were rules stated somewhere prior to these rules that stated how far away a drug consumption site, because I was mm. really much under the impression that it was like 100 meters or 150 meters, or if it was 200 meters, it was not you know, as the crow flies or something that if there was a change that was made that would incorporate, uh, you know, oh, well, what if we made it 200 meters? How many of them are close to daycare centers and schools now? Mm -hmm. long, does that allow us to close them? So, and I've not been able to find that, but I'll, I'll still research that and ask some questions and try to figure out if there's something at that end that has changed as well. Because if, if there is, this is, it's not being reported. Right. Why it is, because I mean, that's a natural question. It's like, well, how did all of these end up within 200 meters of it. So my question is, are these sites, are these sites that were there? And then when we've got the national uh, child care program, and then people started opening their daycares. Some of them were close to sites that were already there. Now they're talking, Oh my God, look at this. We've got some drug sites close to, you know, consumption sites close to these things. Now we have to, we have to close them mm -hmm. or whether or not. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's because, tough. because in the case of the story, Montreal, that we, we talked about a while ago, the one that was close to the park, it was a relatively new one that was granted a special exception. Right. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like how did, how did 10 of the 17 manage to suddenly find themselves near to be eligible to be shut down this way? Um, so they will be uh, forced to close by March 31st, 2025. That means at least 10 of the current sites will shut down, including five in Toronto. In addition to Sudbury, sites in Timmins and Windsor closed in the last year because they ran out of money, leaving drug users in large swaths of the province without services. Jones pointed to an increase in violent crime in neighborhoods where these sites are located, including, quote, including the shooting death of Carolina hubner Makarat, a mother in Toronto's South Riverdale last July. Quote, in Toronto, there's been numerous stories of altercations, stabbings, shootings, and even a homicide in the vicinity of these sites, she said. Our first priority must always be protecting our communities, especially when it comes to some of our most innocent and vulnerable our children. Now, that's another one of those PR lines. Mm -hmm. Sounds really good. I mean, who's against protecting our most innocent and vulnerable our children? Are our addicts also not innocent and vulnerable? They don't care about that. They see addicts as evil and not worthy. Our first are addicts not part of our communities. Again, they don't see them as worthy. They don't see them as people. They don't see them as human. Your first priority must not always be protecting our communities. Your first priority is keeping the residents of your province safe. All of them. No exceptions. That's their job, but they shirk their duty on a daily. All of them. Mm -hmm. So right now they're saying, in order to save the children and protect them, we must let them die. 
you must let addicts die. If you don't have the services for them, maybe they'll die off quicker and the problem will solve itself. That's what it sounded like to me. Well, you got to see this. I got, I got a, a, a tweet I'm, and a clip for you okay. from Sebastian Skamsky talking okay. about exactly what we're talking about. Okay, go ahead. So here's the tweet. CBC's so-called expert with 23 letters behind her name deems Trudeau's crime-ridden drug dens essential and equates them to cancer treatment centers. These are the wacko expert Trudeau uses to defend his drug disaster. These are the wacko expert voices media pedals. So let's watch this clip first, and then I'm going to show you something else immediately after. But you okay. don't close an essential services. What are we going to close next? Are we going to close cancer treatments because people are drink alcohol and alcohol produces cancer? Are we going to close them? But you don't close an essential right? services. What okay. are we going to? Alcohol causes cancer. This guy's calling her a wacko. Mm -hmm. From Ryan Turnbull. So far this week, Pierre deleted his Our Home video for a lack of Canadian footage. His MP from Peterborough deleted her post claiming the cost of living was driving families to traffic their children. And now his media relations guy is insulting the CEO of the Registered Nurses Association for standing up for evidence-based policy that saves lives. Yep. <sighs> they yep. don't give a damn. No. They don't care. No, no, no. They don't care. Listen, he's calling the expert in the field a wacko when she compares alcohol consumption to, to people developing cancer from alcohol. And, and we know what happens. This is, this is not a surprise. This is not a shock. This is not a secret. He's calling her a wacko because he doesn't like what she has to say. But here, here's the thing that I find very interesting is, is yeah. He calls her a wacko, calls them drug dens, but what about this? Don't they dare can close those whiskey dens? Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it's so, but, all just so hypocritical. So if you're in Ontario over the past few weeks, right? If you're an addict, you're dispensable. Period. If you're a kid in the child welfare system living in unlicensed care, you're forgettable. And if you live in an LTC, you're expendable. Mm -hmm. This has been our experience of oh, Doug yes. Ford so far. <sighs> Hubner Makur so back to the, the thing here. Hubner Makuret's death is a disturbing tragedy. It warrants investigation that perhaps leads to reforms to the site in question and lessons for safe injection sites around the country. But it's also not the norm. It certainly should not result in the abolition of safe consumption sites in populated urban areas, places where they're most needed. The government has also not demonstrated that increases in crime are a direct result of people using safe consumption sites, as opposed to other wider societal factors, including poverty, homelessness, and untreated mental illness. As for the fear of picking up needles, which Jones also referenced, safe consumption sites can actually reduce needle debris in surrounding areas in addition to reducing overdose and rates of HIV. Protecting our kids is a priority but the provincial government seems willing to trade off for increased rates of preventable death, harmful waste, and infectious disease, all of which could conceivably put children at risk. The province claims it will simultaneously invest $378 million into homelessness and addiction treatment services, providing 375 supportive housing units, as well as treatment beds. Nine of the safe consumption sites that will shut down have the option to turn into one of these treatment hubs, according to Jones, but they won't be able to supervise drug consumption or even provide needle exchange services. While more treatment capacity is badly needed, it can't replace the urgent life-saving work of overdose reversal. Not everyone who dies of an overdose is addicted to drugs, and not everyone who is addicted to drugs is ready to stop using. The decision to keep using should not mean a death sentence. And that is something that the Supreme Court of Canada has actually decided on. Mm. Nor do these options have to exist in silos. After all, safe consumption sites can be a gateway to drug treatment, but people cannot enter drug addiction treatment if they aren't alive. Quote, if the government chooses to focus only on treatment, it will not provide the relief that we all seek, said Michael Parkinson, coordinator of the Drug Strategy Network of Ontario, a harm reduction advocacy group. There are hundreds of thousands of Ontario residents who might benefit from treatment, but we cannot scale that up fast enough. 
Ontario's decision comes as part of a big, larger backlash to the harm reduction movement, with the Conservative leader, Pierre Polyev, who showed up on cue through his spokesperson, of course he did. promising to pull federal funding for consumption sites, which he refers to as drug dens, when there is no federal funding Zero. at all. Zero so federal funding. He's promising to do some, he's promising to fix something that does not exist to be fixed. Alberta has already forced two sites to close, including one in Lethbridge, the busiest one in North America at one time. Safe drug consumption sites aren't new, and there's good evidence backing their efficacy. There are over 200 such sites in 14 countries around the world, with North America's first one, Insight, opening in Vancouver in 2003. We have 21 years of data in Canada. Mm -hmm. There has been only one recorded death at a site in B.C., which is pretty remarkable when you consider that more than 44,000 Canadians have died of a drug overdose since 2016. Fritz note so one at a safe consumption site, 43,999 outside of them, and how many of them alone? Mm -hmm. How many people died alone, either in their bathroom or their home mm -hmm. or in an alleyway or in a hotel room? Well, and, and something else you need to consider here that too, that seldom gets discussed is that not every addict is um, living oh, on the streets. No, no. There no. are many functioning addicts in society today. Absolutely. Absolutely. We only focus on the ones living in encampments and on the street, right? But yeah. we don't, we don't. Somebody told me the joke. It was like, what, what's the difference? So somebody who uses cocaine in a bathroom in a bar and somebody who's using it in the bathroom of the Royal York. There's no difference. One just has a, a bigger budget. One goes to jail for longer, the other one doesn't. Well, the wealthy never go. They yeah. seldom ever serve time. Yeah. yeah. Fritz noted that many of these sites, including Sudbury's, were never given the types of resources needed to operate at full scale. For example, despite the fact that deaths from smoking drugs are outpacing those that come from injection drug use, most sites in Ontario don't have spaces for inhalation. Meanwhile, so people are moving away from injectables. Mm -hmm. so, so, okay, now we don't need a safe injection site, we need a safe inhalation site, which of course is more complicated because you have to have proper ventilation because for the staff working there, you don't want to get the ancillary inhalation. Exactly, exactly. Right, so it makes it more complicated. In that sense. Meanwhile, the street drug supply is getting worse, as fentanyl mixed with strong benzodiazepines and animal tranquilizers are killing people and causing more severe withdrawals. In spite of that, Jones says the province does not support safe supply, the prescribing of pharmaceutical opioids to replace much more dangerous street drugs. Considering the alarming number of deaths we're facing and the gut-wrenching sight of visible poverty and addiction in many neighborhoods, it's not surprising that people are frustrated. That frustration is leading people to blame harm reduction policies on the current crisis, rather than creating more awareness about how harm reduction works. Politicians like Ontario Premier Doug Ford and Polyev are bolstering that narrative, contradicting evidence coming from public health experts. Fritz remembers the looks of betrayal in the faces of people who used Sudbury's site when it closed down. The space had been designed with their input, and half of the staff were community members, she said. Quote, it was so painful to see. They're like... All my friends are dead and we have nowhere to go. You know what I said yesterday about these subcultures mm -hmm. having traditions of their own and ways of their own and networks of their own and people mm -hmm. who watch out for people on their own. These people have friends. Take that away from them. What is it? What, what are the odds that it's more likely that they would want to use drugs when they find out that their friend has died? Uh, yeah, I'd say pretty high. Yeah. Trying to cope with the pain and emotion. They're not and... bad people. They are people living a life that maybe we do not understand. Mm. That we would never want to live. Maybe it's so unsavory to us that we don't even want to see it. There's a lot of truth to that. But they're not bad people. And they have friendships. They have people they love. Of course they do. Of course they do. To Just think otherwise like would be us. ridiculous. They are not subhuman. 
They are not subhuman. They are not lesser than. They have a bigger struggle, mm -hmm. but they are not lesser than. As the title of the movie goes, they are not children of a lesser God. Right. During Joan's announcements, she said, people who use drugs deserve support, resources, and the opportunity to recover and thrive. They also deserve the opportunity to remain alive. Closing down safe drug consumption sites in the midst of a historic overdose epidemic will not help anyone to thrive, and our politicians should know that by now. If they continue to let drug users die at this shameful pace while ignoring and eliminating solutions we know save lives, it will become harder and harder to believe that's not what they actually want. I'm already convinced. I'm already convinced that that's mm -hmm. what they want. Now, it seems that this decision um, from Ford to do this goes against all advice. Of all course advice. it does, because he knows better. Yeah. Um, Ed... Word Keenan, who's a Toronto-based city columnist for the Star, uh, had written something, and uh, at the end of it, he said, "It's like taking life preserver away from an actively drowning person because you strongly prefer they learn how to swim. Even if you're investing in some long-term learn-to-swim programs at the same time, taking the flotation devices away from those currently thrashing away in the water is only going to kill people." There's a comment from. Uh, Diana Chan McNally. She is a community worker, educator. Uh, we'll leave it at that. She's a very accomplished individual, and this is what she has to say about this because I think it's uh, something that should be stated because it really sums it all up. The missing piece regarding uh, Doug Ford shutting down uh, safe consumption sites is that this isn't just their callous and negligent drug strategy. It's also their homelessness strategy. It's embedded in the acronym for HEART, Homelessness and Addiction Recovery Treatment Hubs. They are reframing homelessness not as the outcome of government policy, cho policy choices regarding housing, eviction, social assistance, etc., but rather as an individual problem of addiction, as though all, all unhoused people use drugs and drugs are the only barrier to accessing housing. Wow. Now, there have been uh, reviews of all that type of stuff. There's a, there's a committee or a group or an organization that provides advice to the government of Ontario on this. And the experts did not recommend this course of action. They did not recommend this course of action. In fact, they recommended that there should be more of these sites. Mm. So they are getting the best expert advice and they said, yeah, now um, we understand but uh, we're going to go another way. Uh, there's a thread here from Jillian Kola, K-O-L-L-A, PhD, Assistant Professor, Memorial University, collaborating scientist, expert in harm reduction, social determinants of health, and drug policy. <clears throat> and um, she mentions here in the thread that uh, Jones was clear in her announcement that no new supervised consumption sites would be allowed to open in Ontario. This means that sites being forced to close will not be able to move and reopen. This plan will result in the closure of more than half of all the sites in Ontario. To give an idea of impacts, from March 20th to Jan from March 2020 to January 2024, Toronto Public Health's safe consumption sites reversed 2,306 overdoses, and South Riverdale's reversed 1,001. Put simply, the closure of 10 SSC SCSs across Ontario means that fatal overdose rates will increase. In addition to increased overdose deaths, closure of these sites also means increased impacts on overstretched, 
on overstretched fire ambulance and emergency departments because rather than having their overdose treated as an, at an SES, people overdose in community resulting in 911 calls. And if hospitals, emergency rooms are filled with people that could have been treated as an SES, what happens to you when you need well, to go to emergency services? That's what the ER doctor spoke about yesterday that I showed the clip. Yep. You that's wait. exactly what he was saying. Yep. Important to note that no closures of any supervised consumption sites in Ontario were recommended by the review of South Riverdale Community Health Centre commissioned by the Ontario government. The supervised, so basically, they asked for mm -hmm. this type of information and they said, here are the things that you should not do. And then the government said, great, that's what exactly what we'll do. The supervisor's report did not recommend closures of any site. The idea that closing sites because of proximity to schools is necessary is a fear-mongering strategy not supported by evidence or the recent reviews commissioned by the Ontario government. Sites that are being forced to close will be given priority to trans transition to hard hubs, but the devil is in the details. To receive funding, hard hubs cannot provide supervised consumption services, prescribe safer supply, or distribute any sterile injection equipment. Uh, Minister Jones said they might be able to be used as a syringe drop-off. Mm -hmm. But if nobody trusts you to go there, why would they drop off stuff there? Was, oh, yes, because this thing, this place that was organized by people I don't trust, whatnot, well, yes, I never want to go in there and they can't provide me the services. But hey, as an addict, let me make sure that I take time to actually stop in there to mm -hmm. get rid of my needles. Said no one ever. Nobody ever. Well, this, this, this quote here from Cassie, just curious if there will soon be a chain of taxpayer-funded Weston Family Wellness Centers for forced treatment for those with addictions. Mm. You know damn well that's on the horizon. They're doing it for foster homes. I'm not saying that they're Western-sponsored, but... Look, Doug will privatize everything. If there's a profit to be made somewhere, he'll do it. And he doesn't give a shit. Shockingly, it seems that heart hubs will have to apply for special permission to even allow needles to be returned there. Given recent concern with needles discarded in community, this really makes no sense at all. It's important to note that many of the SCSs being targeted for closure are located within CHCs, so that's community health centers, that have large sterile injection equipment distribution programs, some that have been in operation since the 1990s. This suggests one of the purposes of this announcement is a complete rollback of harm reduction programming altogether, including HIV prevention programs like sterile needle distribution that have decades of evidence supporting their cost effectiveness and health benefits. It costs about, if I'm not, not mistaken, uh, $135,000 a year to keep someone who's HIV positive alive mm -hmm. because the cost of the drugs are just that high. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money. Oh, sorry, not, no, sorry, sorry, sorry excuse me, 36,000, not 136,000. Not 136. Yeah, not 136, 36. Yeah. pardon me. Um, so um, $36,000 a year per person, mm -hmm. more of them now, if they're sharing needles, they're not clean, versus the $300,000 a year in funding and whatnot that it keeps takes to keep one site alive or something. I, I'm mm -hmm. not sure what the budget is, but come on. Like this. And then again, lost productivity. Someone dies at These 35 that was reasonably expected, that could have reasonably been expected to live till 70 something. Otherwise, all those years of lost productivity, they're just, they're just, they're torching investment in people. They're torching investment in people. So to apply for heart um, hub funding, the SCS being forced to close, which includes five of the largest needle and syringe distribution programs in Toronto, would also have to cease all sterile injection equipment distribution and stop safe for supply prescribing. In addition to the abject cruelty of closing the majority of the SCSs in the province, which sees thousands of visits per year and the increase in fatal overdose that will result from this, we can expect to see increases in HIV and hepatitis C transmission, as well as increasing infectious and bacterial complications as thousands of people will lose access to sterile injection equipment. From a public health standpoint, this is absolutely awful and is atrocious health policy. The conservative plan seems to be closed, seems to be to close SCSs and sterile needle distribution programs that are serving thousands of people a month. 
and instead move people to receive treatment services located in the heart hubs, but there is no capacity in the treatment system for this. The plan seems to have been made without consultation with existing treatment or harm reduction services. There is no indication that there is infrastructure or human resources capacity within the addiction treatment sector to implement this by March 2025, just seven months away. It is magical thinking to think the rollout of heart hubs will be possible in the timelines proposed, particularly given the overall state of strain in the healthcare system right now and difficulty staffing health programs. On the face of it, the plan is disastrous. And as well, if there's going to be an election coming on, because <laughs> it's not going to be like a the party that is currently the government that is calling a snap election in order to... Uh, be able to extend its term is going to be focused in any way in getting this done right or competently or efficiently. Organizations are speaking out about their concerns. For example, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health has put out a statement of concern about these changes, and that's from the Canadian uh, Mental Health Association. And um, I will include a link here for you, Mr. Grizzly, to uh, share with the, the kits about that. Now, we get to the worst part well, of this, because it gets worse. Of course it does. It's Doug Ford. I mean, this is, look, this, I, I know this is, is, is uh, I'm going to show you something now that's always brings a smile to my face whenever I see something from this individual, except this time, even though it's, it's written in a comedic style, it's dead bang on. Like, this is Barney Panofsky's best intentions. Letter from, from uh, Doug Ford. Dear my friends, I am working hard criticizing union leaders and shutting down Trudeau's drug dens because those things are way more disgusting than my funny joke about Ontarians going to vet clinics for MRI. So please only pay attention to my outrage in Brian Lilly, Premier. The thing is, I, I'm not laughing about that one this time because it's so bloody accurate. Yeah. It's so bloody accurate. And I know that, you know, it's like Barney Panofsky, my name's not Gordy, writes great stuff. It's hilarious. His, his, and, and he will tell you, uh, what is it? Hang on, just give me a second here. There was one the other day where somebody was criticizing, oh, I didn't find that one funny. It was like it wasn't supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be. He's a or former something. progressive conservative specializing in delivering satirical irony through interpretive dance since June 2018. <laughs> if anyone orders Merlot, I'm leaving. That's his bio. But the thing is, he's written this stuff to make fun of the premier, except it's so bloody accurate. It's disturbing. Yeah. CP24, Ford defends plan to close 10 supervised drug consumption sites despite experts calling for more to open. And as I read this to you, the quotes, mm. the quotes, okay. <laughs> Premier Doug Ford is defending his government's decision to shutter 10 of Ontario's 23 supervised drug consumption sites due to their proximity to schools and childcare centers. I do not know why the numbers keep on changing because it was 10 of 17 now. This one says 10 of 23. So what the number is, who knows now. Quote from oh, Doug Ford. Yeah. I just don't believe safe consumption sites. I've listened to people in the neighborhoods. I've consulted with them. I've been getting endless phone calls about needles being in the parks, needles being by the schools and by the daycares. That's unacceptable, Ford told reporters following an unrelated news conference in St. Catharines on Wednesday afternoon. I just don't believe safe consumption sites. You're not required to. You're not. You're not required. You're required to look at the data. I don't care what you believe or disbelieve. You can believe in the flying spaghetti monster for all I care. But you have hard data to back up. I've listened Things that are contrary to what you're saying. I've listened to people in the neighborhoods. I've consulted with them. The people in the neighborhoods know more about harm reduction and drug policy than. Not saying that the, con the, the concerns of the people in the neighborhoods should not be listened to, of course. But you should also be listening to the expert recommendation. And you should also be listening to the experience of addicts. Those currently in the system and those who have graduated from the system or have been helped by the, by the system. And then you're supposed to put it all together and come with a picture. 
I've been getting endless phone calls about needles being in the parks, needles being by the schools. Uh, would that be 10 to 15 calls a day? Somehow I doubt it. Like you said that you were getting about kids in uh, unlicensed care? Mm -hmm. Because those 10 to 15 calls a day uh, led you to say, oh, gee, that's unfortunate for them. Uh, what are we, when are we having cheesecake? And uh, these calls, though, however, uh, oh, this got you to uh, move. Didn't it, Doug? Mm -hmm. Didn't it, Doug? Yeah. It's always the same lines, eh? My phone's been blowing off the hook. I get all these calls. Quote, giving someone an addict a place to do their injections, we haven't seen it get better. So, you haven't seen it get better. Is that because these safe consumption sites create more addicts? Or is it because the fact that, oh, I don't know, people uh, on ODSP can't make ends meet or um, people who have a workplace injury who then get prescribed opioids and get hooked have no place to go to get help? Or is it because uh, so many people are homeless and you've eliminated rent control? Or is it... Hmm? Why, Doug? Why is the addiction crisis getting worse? Yeah. These centers well, we built so that we could keep people alive is what's making it worse. Safe <laughs> supply to keep people alive is what's making it No, what's making it worse. These, for the most part, if you take the exception of, for example, people who have been injured and then they get hooked, mm -hmm. or somebody who says, hey, just try it once. And then they go hook. A lot of these are situations of despair and desperation. Yes. Something else happened that drove them there. Something happened that's, that's, that caused them to seek to self-medicate. Well, remember I said yesterday. You need to address that. I've had days where, you know, I enjoy a drink. I do. I enjoy a glass of wine, a beer, the occasional whiskey. But I am not somebody who needs alcohol. I can do without. I've gone six months. Just I'm just, I don't want anything. Doctor says, okay, we're putting you on new medication. You can't drink anything. Okay. It, it's not, I don't have an addiction to it. But there are days when you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders and you're like, I need a drink. So I go to a safe consumption site, the pub, where there are actually people trained to recognize when you've had too much and they cut you off and send you home. To say that a safe consumption site for somebody using narcotics is not the same thing as a pub is ridiculous. It, it's not only is it the same thing as a pub, but it's a few steps above it because there are people, does, people that are trained there to save lives if somebody gets overdoses, if somebody has a reaction. They can test their, their drugs to make sure that they are safe supply, like the pub is a safe supply for the drug of choice of alcohol. And, and let's not forget, as Senator Patrick Brazo has lobbied and is lobbying to put on a, a, a stamp on bottles of, of liquor, beer, wine, that they do cause cancer because it's been proven that it does. We know this. Nurses just said it causes cancer. And yet, when she says, are we going to shut down cancer treatment centers because people develop cancer from alcohol consumption, you get the, the mouthpiece for Pierre Polyev basically coming up and calling her a wacko for calling out the truth. I think Mr. Beaver is frozen, I believe. Yeah, he seems to have frozen and, and uh, disappeared for a moment or two. I don't know if his computer is hacked out on him. Um, by the way, we, we haven't installed the new one yet because I have to go over it with him on the process and what he needs to do. I also have a couple of additional components he's going to need to make it operational. So we'll get to it soon. I promise you, very soon. He's going to be here this Saturday because we are having a podcast, our monthly podcast. Uh, we didn't do one in July, but we had one in June which was the Mental Health Walk podcast. And July was, well, I was on vacation for three weeks, as you all well know, and things were up in the air. But we will have a podcast this Saturday, live from the Lieutenant's Pump at 361 Elegant Street in beautiful downtown Ottawa. Speaking of beautiful downtown Ottawa, I have to bring you a clip that I talked about earlier that Cassie sent me 
that I thought, well, you know what, here's a good chance to show this because it relates to what we went through in downtown Ottawa in late January and early February of 2022. And um, this is when I say to you, irony is dead. This guy is a convoyer, currently a ditch billy. Uh, ditch billy because he's on the side of the road in Alberta, camped out. And his name is Ron Clark. Listen to what this person has to say, because it will shock you. <laughs> Shocked me, anyway. <sighs> Not really, but... <laughs> so they got these driveless taxi cars running around the parking lot with the horns going and lights flashing. Can you imagine? That would drive you bonkers. That would absolutely drive you... I've, I'm, after a couple of days, uh, I would go and dismantle the car if I lived close to it. Like, it's kind of funny. It's not, it's not at my door, but technology, all the technology, when a bug happens, things happen. But let's keep moving forward and forward with more technology. I think he came to the realization of what he just said. <laughs> so the guy... Like... <laughs> uh, this guy just... <sighs> I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Mr. Beaver's uh, internet died on him. He's going to reboot his computer and then log in on his phone if his computer uh, doesn't have a connection. Yeah, the, the, the irony is completely lost on this person. It's like he almost realizes what he's saying then just decides to play it off. <sighs> All that noise would drive me crazy. Yeah. We put up with it for a few weeks because of clowns like you insisted on torturing us. It's the first time I've had or heard from a single one of them come to the realization of how annoying that is. And he's talking about taxi cab horns, not big trucks with 110 to 120 dB air horns, taxi cabs. Irony is dead. <laughs> Well, it's completely lost on these yahoos anyway. In other news, um, I don't know if you heard about this, but uh, Adam Zivo, he uh, is a columnist or a writer, I guess, for the National Post, the Chatham Asset Hedge Fund Management owned uh, rag. And, uh, well... I'll show you a photo here in case you haven't seen it. This is Adam Zivo with um, Pierre Polyev shaking hands. Adam Zivo admitted to spying for a foreign government. Oh, and have you noticed uh, Pierre's shirt, the common sense? Looks an awful lot like the beaver canoe design. Is there not an intellectual property theft there going on? And he's selling these t-shirts? So Adam Zivo spied for a foreign government. And here's the story. Uh, let me just pull it up here and I will uh, explain it to you. He says he spied, let me just bring it over here where it's easier for me to read for you. This National Post columnist says he spied for a foreign intel agency. Experts call his behavior unethical and absurd. National Post columnist Adam Zivo says he was moonlighting as a foreign intel asset at the same time as he worked for the National Post. Wow. Talk about ethical violations. My goodness. Mr. Beaver, are you there, sir? I am there. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what Yay. happened there. You, you yep. froze and I kept talking. I think, yeah, I think he's frozen. And sure enough, you were. But I, you're, yep. I don't know. Internet you're a little fuzzy right now, but nope. you're here. So that's all that matters. Yep. Internet said, uh, well, computer says no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Pretty much what happened, and uh, yes, Miss Kit, Miss, I am with Virgin Internet. <laughs> so yes, said so, you're with Virgin Internet. I've been having internet issues with mine occasionally. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, uh, uh, I'm gonna 
loop back to what I was speaking of before, but I know that you were talking about the Adam Zevo thing there. Yes. We'll get yeah. to that in a minute. That is, uh, that's a big story. Weird. Yeah. That's weird. Uh, did so you want here, to finish here's it since a guy you started who, it? Well, yeah. Okay. So yeah. here's the guy again, Adam Zevo, who is spying. It says, is it ethical for a journalist to wear a wire to dinner and spy for a foreign intel agency at the same time as they're writing for one of Canada's biggest newspapers? Most experts on journalism ethics say might say that's clearly unethical, but National Post columnist Adam Zevo is adamant. He sees no problem with presenting himself as a journalist by day while, by day while moonlighting for a foreign spy agency by night. Zivu, who was sanctioned by Russia in August 2022, has recently been sharing dramatic and fantastical stories about a weird espionage experience he had while he was doing war zone, reporting on Russia's invasion of Ukraine for the National Post. In the first installment of his story, he tweeted unprompted after midnight on a weekend, Zivu revealed he worked with Ukraine's spy agency, the Security Service of Ukraine or SPU, in a counter-intel operation that saw him strap a wire to his chest and go undercover in an attempt to entrap a man he suspected was a Chinese spy. I met the Chinese man and his wife at a restaurant while wearing a wire, Zivo said in one tweet. The SBU officers watched us from a car parked outside, which had tinted windows. <sighs> Zivo shared additional details about his spy story and statements to which press progress revealing, revealing that he, is also, he also compiled multiple pr- reports which he claims he sent to Canada's spy agency. The uh, CSIS, Canadian Security Intelligence Services, well as to the Ukrainian government and his employer, the National Post. After my initial interaction with Zhang, I drafted a detailed report, which I quickly provided to the National Post, CSIS, and the Ukrainian government, he told Press Progress. After the recorded dinner, I produced transcripts and a follow-up report, which is also shared with these stakeholders. According to Zivo, he has no information that confirms the man was actually a spy and his initial contact with the man, as well as with CSIS and Ukrainian intelligence, were all undertaken on his own initiative by Zivo himself. Shortly after releasing a statement to Press Progress, Zivo elaborated with additional details while guest hosting on Toronto's AM640 talk radio. Introducing his segment with music from James Bond in the 1960s sitcom Get Smart. Oh, God. <laughs> Experts specializing in journalism ethics agree Zivo's claim that he spied for a foreign intel agency is an ethical problem on multiple levels. The fact that he engaged in a wire-wearing act in partnership with an intel agency is absurd, and it's obviously truly unethical, but it's clear that he doesn't think so. Sonia Fata, the associate chair, associate chair of Toronto Metropolitan University School of Journalism, told Press Progress. What is startling about this is just how openly he has shared his story, which means that in his mind... There's no conflict. Brent Jolly, president of the Canadian Association of Journalists, agrees Zivo's spy story is problematic and ethically murky. I think you have to be clear what your role is, Jolly told Press Progress, adding, journalists must always be very, very clear about when you're doing one thing and when you're another. I don't think we can go around and just have people one minute working for CSIS and the next writing a story about what an amazing job CSIS is doing. Mm. Zivo says he's written over 80 articles about Ukraine since the beginning of the war and credits himself for spotlighting local Ukrainian voices. However, the National Post also published several articles by Zivo about Ukraine that overlap with the timeline of Zivo's purported spying for Ukrainian intel, including articles criticizing Canada and other NATO allies over their inadequate support for Ukraine's war effort. None of the articles disclosed that the author was also simultaneously spying on behalf of UK, Ukraine's intel agency. Zivo is a man of many hats and self-identifies as a multifaceted professional. While he at oh, times yes. presents himself as a journalist, he also presents himself at other times as a content vendor, a filmmaker, an activist, a geopolitical analyst via an ecosystem of NATO-affiliated NGOs. He graduated from the Monk School of Public Policy and Global Affairs in 2020 and has since done work for the NATO Association of Canada, as well as a right-wing foreign policy-oriented think tank called the McDonald laurier Institute. Zivo, whose legal name is Adam Zvinjovic, I hope I said that correctly, is also named on corporate documents as a director of an advocacy group called the Canadian Centre for for Responsible Drug Policy, alongside Mm -hmm. Dr. Julian Summers, a controversial anti-safe supply advocate whom Zivo previously previously showcased in his past National Post columns. Mm -hmm. He presents himself in a number of different ways, Fada observes. He often presents himself as a journalist, but he's also wearing a million hats, and and he's obviously not engaging with the media ethics part of this. 
Fatah, who teaches a course on media ethics, says Zivo's spy story might make an interesting case study for students in journalism schools. Fatah points out that the spy story highlights a really problematic questions about conflicts of interest, the culture of international reporting, relationships with state authorities, issues with freelance labor, as well as questions about how journalists build personal brands and share information about themselves using social media. After Russia's February 2022 invasion, Zivo says he dropped everything and traveled to Ukraine, a country with which he had no prior connection, so he could document the war as a journalist, compelled by what he describes as a sense of moral necessity. I felt that I could do more good by reporting on the war on the ground, Zivo told Press Progress. I quit my day job and spent too much reporting on the conflict in the spring of 2022. According to his various versions of the story, Zivo claims that in December 2022, several months after Russia launched its war on Ukraine, he found himself at an Odessa mall when he noticed a guy speaking English loudly, in quotes, while he was shopping for furniture at a store he describes as the Ukrainian version of Ikea. Zivo later clarified that he was referring to Yisk, a Danish-owned multinational household good retail chain that also operates in Canada. Mm -hmm. I look over and I see this Chinese guy, Zivo recalls. He was speaking English loudly, and I was like, okay, I'm very interested in understanding minority experience in Ukraine. I go and I say hi to him, and I think this guy could be a friend. After approaching the man on his own initiative and explicitly introducing himself as a Canadian journalist, Zivo says he began to notice red flags. He claimed the man told him he once lived in the Ottawa area, had an Ontario driver's license, and was covered in tattoos and also said, bro, a lot. Acting only on this bad vibe, Zivo says he looked the man up on Facebook and began compiling a dossier on him, which he later sent unsolicited to CSIS. The National Post columnist claims he spoke for an hour on the phone with CSIS about what he found on the man's social media profile, but was told the spy agency would not accept a PDF of his dossier for cybersecurity reasons. Frustrated, Zivo claims he took a taxi to a Ukrainian military checkpoint surrounded by sandbags and was led to a little wooden shed by armed guards where he spent a full day using Duolingo to walk a perplexed group of soldiers through his suspicions about the stranger whom he had approached at the shopping mall. In a subsequent meeting with Ukraine intelligence um, agents, Zivo says he volunteered to wear a wire and record himself dining with the man at a restaurant called Kompot, which he describes as the Olive Garden of the Ukraine. Zivo says his handlers expressed concern for his safety, but he insisted he would ultimately feel safer if he caught the suspected spy himself. <clears throat> After strapping a recording device used to his chest using, in quotations, scotch tape and staging the undercover counter intel operation at the restaurant, Zivo claims the man abrupt, abruptly fled to Odessa and relocated to Antwerp, Belgium with his wife. He claims he provided the full transcript of his recordings and a debriefing report to the Ukrainian government, CSIS, and the National Post. He insists he sees no problem with what he did because he was trying to protect fellow citizens from predatory foreign agents. Oh, yes. My actions were ethical, Zivo told Press Progress. Journalists working in war zones have a right to investigate threats to their safety with the assistance of local security forces, if necessary. Despite his confidence and moral certainty, Fatah says it's unlikely most newsrooms would contone their journalists spying for foreign intel agencies. I imagine most newsrooms would be horrified, Fatah said. I would assume most people wouldn't put out a post like that because they would think, oh my God, this is horrifying. I should never be exposed for what I've done. From the publishing side, the publisher and the editor should be aware of this and should be having a conversation and should consider whether or not it's appropriate to work with a journalist who engages on the side with intel agencies. Yeah, think. Uh, Jolie agrees, noting that acting as a foreign intel asset could compromise the integrity of journalists and news organizations. I would be concerned if I was his editor to see what compromises, perhaps, have been made or what was the arrangement, Jolie said. There's all kinds of quid pro quos that go out here that I think that can be used to manipulate the press or to have one's integrity be compromised. Jolie noted, journalists occasionally embed on police stings or drug busts through newsrooms are typically careful to avoid being seen as a plant for any law enforcement agency. There's a process and a lot of conversation and deliberation about whether to engage in that. National Post Editor-in-Chief Rob Roberts and Managing Editor Carson Jarima, you know my thoughts on Carson, did not respond to several requests for comment from Press Progress, though Zivo says the National Post was aware of what he was doing. doing. 
I informed them of what was occurring and that I was working with local authorities to address my safety concerns, Zevo told Press Progress, later clarifying he did not run this by my editors for a sign-off since he did not need permission because he's a freelancer, not a staff writer. Interesting mm. how he thinks of that. What? Okay. Um, mm. Freelancer, not a staff writer. Okay. Mm, well, Zivo, yeah, yeah, convenient. Well, Zivo suggests his actions were designed to protect international journalists from hostile foreign agents, given the Russian government's long track record of murdering and jailing journalists. Jolly said Zivo's story could have the opposite effect and put international correspondents and local <laughs> Ukrainian journalists on the ground at greater risks by legitimizing the narratives of Russian propagandists. Whether it's Putin or the Belarusian guy or whoever journalists are high value diplomatic tools and jailing them. Or who, sorry, let me start that over. Whether it's Putin or the Belarusian guy or whoever, journalists are high value diplomatic tools and jailing them or discrediting them is an Orwellian tool in an authoritarian playbook, Jolly said. We know the Russian government has a huge capacity to put out propaganda and disinformation. And I think this is something that could very easily fall into their hands and legitimize their arguments. Fatah said, says Zivo's epic, classic, old-school Western story tale where he's going to root out these bad guys and help the system also speaks to a problematic way in which Western journalists interact in non-Western environments. There's a bravado about being a reporter in war zones that can posit on a reporter a sense of power that can be really problematic if you are not in touch with the ethics of what, are you, what you're doing, Fatah said. This just uh, is, is a mind-blowing story, and it just... <laughs> I just, this is Zivo guy. If you're not familiar with his work, um, like listen to all the quotes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I felt it would have been better if I did it myself. I was trying to protect all the other, like who asked you? He's doing the, no one but me can. Nobody. Yeah, exactly. It's like, no, no, it isn't wrong. I'm entitled to do this. Mm hmm he works he has all these associations with all these organizations and the a really problematic one is his anti-safe supply crusade which he um uses his platform as a i guess a freelancer with the national mm -hmm. post mm -hmm. to put out all the time and uh if you are so this is actually kind of interesting that you mentioned the story with adam zivo this way because it still connects back to the issue that we we're talking about you know drug use and addiction and safe mm -hmm. supply. Because uh, if there's one person out there that really does not think very highly of Adam Zifo, it's Guy Felicello. Yeah, and there's because, good reason for that. Now, Adam Zifo, I'm going to put this uh, up here. This is something that recently happened involving him. Mm. And, I, and I will get back to the thing I was mentioning about uh, Doug Ford, Kits and Cups. I'll, 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 I'll loop back. You'll see. Um, safe supply drug patient photo draws social media fire and his doctor's defense. Um, this happened in the, the London Free Press, and Adam Zivo is involved in this somehow. Guy Felicella, a new low, stigmatizing individual teens without evidence. Back in June, a patient of a clinic in London, Ontario, was photographed talking to two teenagers at a high school after his appointment. The photo was shared with the clinic and the high school that same day, and the clinic immediately took action. They canceled his prescription and notified police. No doubt the two boys also received a talking to from the school and their parents. On Tuesday, the Epoch Times and National Post opinion writer Adam Zivo posted those photos from June. He claimed they show the patient selling his prescribed safer supply to the teens, proving his theories, which include widespread diversion to teens, streets flooded with prescription opioids, death caused by safe supply, an increase in teen addictions because of it, etc., None of this was true. No. Publicly posting these photos for their, well, at least not true as in being widespread mm -hmm. issues or the norm. Publicly posting these photos for their community, families, friends, teachers, and all of Canada to see and judge them when we can't even say for sure what occurred from a still photograph is truly awful. So once again, he had a vibe mm -hmm. that someone emerging from there that was talking to kids was trying to sell and that uh, this was proof that sale was going on and then he took the pictures and then he published them 
thus revealing the identity of the teens. Reprehensible behavior. But he's an activist for anti self supply. So he's entitled. Yeah, well, yeah. Just like in Russia, he was entitled. Again. That's the photo. Guy, God, direct from central casting. So, you know, he's uh, shaking hands with Pierre Polyev. Well, Pierre Polyev's uh, wearing a shirt that has stolen the intellectual property of Beaver Canoe. Um, publicly posting those photos for their community, family, friends, teachers of all candidacy and judge them when we can't even say for sure what occurred from a still photograph, as I mentioned before, is truly awful. I'm not going to repost them here, but slightly blurring their faces while leaving their hair, clothing, and shoes identifiable in photos posted to X and already viewed by 83,000 people to date is a new low. You should delete that post. Also, Adam, what happened to your statement during our debate on last month's breakdown podcast that you can see the utility of providing prescribed alternatives to people at risk of death from illicit drugs as long as there are safeguards in place to protect teens from diversion? Did you make any calls before posting the photos publicly on X? If you had, you'd have learned about the immediate action taken by the clinic, i.e. the safeguards you said you wanted to see. Mm -hmm. Weird. You say you care about teenagers, but this post where you actually threw two kids under the bus to make a point sure makes it seem like you care a lot more about your agenda to burn the system to the ground. We see you, Adam. We know what you're doing. Sure hope your clicks and clout are worth it. Read the real story about what happened here. And in the story, it says... This is in the London Free Press. A social media post purporting to show a London safe supply patient selling drugs to teenagers is hardly telling the real story, says the doctor in charge of the program. The post contains unprovable allegations, is missing valuable information, and is punishing an ordinary person trying to seek help for addiction, Dr. Dennis D. Valentino said. Quote, this man should not be in the middle of some media battle. We don't agree that people should be just punished because other people follow them around and photograph them because they're wearing tattered clothes, he said. It's disturbing, and then sharing the pictures of somebody you know to be seeking addiction care without even knowing for sure exactly what happened. He's had no benefit of any doubt. Earlier this week, a photograph of a man and two high school students was posted on X by Adam Zevo, an anti-harm reduction advocate and National Post columnist, and sometimes foreign... <laughs> anyway, I don't know what the exact term being used for what he's doing on the side is. Um... The London Post and London Free Press are both owned by Post Media. So this is in the London Free Press that is owned by Post, and they're running the story. Okay. The Post says that a whistleblower provided the photograph and says it shows a man selling hydromorphin pills from a safe supply program to two high school students. Diversion of safe supply drugs has become a political issue in Canada, and London has become one of the key staging grounds in the federal conservatives', federal conservatives attack on harm reduction measures. The photograph was taken on June 26, Di Valentino told the London Free Press. He operates his safe supply practice from the building at 528 Dundas Street, a methadone service clinic 528 operates in the same building. Methadone is a synthetic opioid that can reduce the cravings for other drugs and help people ease off other opioids. Hydromorphone, under the brand name Dilaudid, is provided to people so they don't have to resort to the toxic mix of street drugs, often a combination of fentanyl and other chemicals. The man photographed June 26th is a patient in the Safe Supply Clinic and Methadone Clinic at 528 Dundas Street, Di Valentino said. Apparently, after a visit to the building, he walked across the road to HBBL Secondary School where someone took the photograph, Di Valentino said. The photograph was shared with his program that same day, he said. Quote, an important piece of the story is that within an hour, we had canceled his prescription for community safety and because he's aware he's not supposed to go across to the high school when he's accessing the program. It's not clear what happened at the high school, he said. It doesn't matter what's in his hand there. It matters that he's not supposed to be there. We also notified the police and asked if they could look into it. So for the program, mm -hmm. it's like whether he was selling or not, mm -hmm. he wasn't supposed to be there. Period. So therefore we canceled his prescription. But Adam Zevo took a picture of someone emerging from that building who went there and was talking to two people and said, aha, he's trying to sell them the drugs. This is proof. And then, because he's fighting for a righteous cause, mm -hmm. just took the liberty 
of blurring a little bit of the faces, but no, no other identifying characteristics. So for example, let's say the kids, uh, you know, they're a little punkish. punkish. Or one might have blue hair. Mm-hmm. Gee, how many people in the city of London, Ontario, close to this school have blue hair? One or two, Gee, I would assume. Pretty easy to, not saying that the kid had blue hair, but let's say there could have been other identifying characteristics. So the identity was, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll just do the face. Mm-hmm. This guy's supposed to be a journalist. I think that if he was an actual journalist, he would know that if you're protecting somebody's identity, you uh, cover all like this. I'll cover the face, but I'll leave the really unique tattoo visible. Yeah. Right. He yeah. threw them under the bus. I'm reporting. Yeah, exactly. For his cause. Mm-hmm. Not, not being a journalist first, being an activist first. I'm an activist and I'm going to pretend that I'm a freelance journalism. Like this, and then I'm going to write my stories like this or give myself the liberties to say, oh my God, look at this story, which actually then fuels my act. Like the conflict of interest is so huge. The lack of morals and ethics is so huge. Oh yeah. It's not clear what happened at the high school, he said. It doesn't matter. Like I said, he was not supposed to be there. The program took further steps to guard against the patient taking away medication in the future, but has not dropped him from the program. Quote, we continue to work with the patient, but we certainly addressed the safety issue immediately and notified all appropriate authorities. Police were called to look into the situation, not to punish the patient, the doctor said. Quote, I don't think anyone wants to see people who are already struggling get in more trouble. We just want to see some boundaries put in so we can help people safely. One of the most troubling aspects of the photograph is how it ended up on social media, Di Valentino said. Quote, we take the community's concerns about diversion very seriously. We want to look for solutions, but we're not we're just going to politicize the battle while further victimizing vulnerable people. Opponents of safer opiate supply programs claim that large amounts of drugs handed out are being sold to others and finding their way to schoolyards. The federal conservatives under Pierre Polyev have promised to end safe supply programs and other harm reduction measures aimed at keeping people alive while they work through addiction at their own pace and ways. Research into one safer supply program at the London Intercommunity Health Center has shown patients' lives and health improve and police and hospitals save money by having fewer interactions with those patients. The Centre, London Police, and the Middlesex London Health Unit are organizing discussions to create protocols around diversion prevention in safe supply programs. His program, which serves about 100 patients, has diversion protocols, but he's already spoken to the health unit about joining the community effort. Quote, we do need to make sure that the diversion is under control, but I don't think we should be going after marginalized patients. We just need to put some type of boundary in place so that we can grow the program and meet more needs because they're growing every day. Now, with this needs growing every day, when I was mentioning Doug Ford, quote, given someone an addict a place to do their injections, we haven't seen it get better. This was supposed to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's the worst thing that could ever happen to a community to have one of these safe injection sites in their neighborhood. Doug Ford. Mm. So if you ever had any doubt whatsoever that he is manufacturing all of this, mm in order to have something to run on, there's your quote that proves there it. There you go. This, this was supposed to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. No. No. Never in the history of anything related to harm reduction has anybody said that overdose protect, protection centers or safe consumption sites were the greatest thing since sliced bread. Nobody said that if you had those, that nobody ever again would have to bear the indignity of seeing an attic out in public. If you had a housing first program, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yes. But, mm-hmm. but wasn't they don't live at the safe conception site after they've consumed well, remember, and heart housing it seems, and, yeah and it seems that they're doing well because that particular drug or supply of drugs wasn't tainted they leave the consumption site or in society nobody said that safe consumption sites would stop 
the opioid crisis or would instantly cure people, but they do act as a conduit when a relationship of trust is built that when somebody's ready to get off the drugs, they can direct them to where they need to go and hopefully those services will be available then because mm-hmm. the province has them ready for when people are ready to use them. Nobody said that this was going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. What they said is that it would keep people alive. One death, 43,999 overdoses reversed. Mm-hmm. That is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, and, and Angela, if you want to come on the show and, and have a chat with us about this, you're more than welcome to, because I know that you have a personal experience with this that I would never want to have to have to go through. Talking about Jordan's mom. Yep. We've had Angela on before. Yep. And she told her story about how she lost her son to unsafe supply. Yep. And how this current government is responsible for it. Yep. We have kids here that are sharing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess I, I will read it in since uh, I mean they put it in the chat, but um, Dilaudid is what I abused the most. It's hard on the body, but clean from other cross contaminants. Now that they are making it harder to get, there are people turning to bad sources. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kit Dan uh, recommended, uh, well, if Doug Ford says that he's getting so many calls, how about we give him uh, 45 to 50 calls a day saying that we want him to do something for addicts and let's see if that uh, motivates him to. Uh... Since he seem, he keeps on saying that he responds to calls, but uh, if he had asked oh, kids that's to a... care, uh, that's kind of a selective action. I'm sure he does respond to calls from Galen Weston, amongst others. Mm -hmm. It's the worst thing that could have ever happened to a community to have one of these safe injection sites in their neighborhood. I could think of some worse things that would happen to a community. Oh, Dougie. I could think of a few things worse that could happen to a community. Isn't this an insane irony from a former drug dealer? (laughs) Again. His brother. Yeah. Someone who might have been, who could have quite well have been doing crack cocaine in a hotel, Royal York Hotel bathroom mm-hmm. yeah. at some point. <sighs> Just, oh, God. The ban, which was officially announced on Tuesday afternoon, will impact nine provincially funding sites, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah. It's... um. Ontario's new plan to shutter supervised drug consumption sites within 200 meters of schools um, and child care centers as well as to not open new ones and limit other harm reduction measures like safe supply and drug decriminalization actually goes against the recommendation of two external reviews it commissioned for its 17 CTS sites as well as the one at Toronto South Riverdale Community Health Centre a year ago. These reports, which were prepared by Unity Health Toronto and completed earlier this year, were launched after 44-year-old Carolina hubner Bakarat was killed by a stray bullet fired outside of the Leslieville site on July 7th, 2023. So one person, Mm -hmm. very tragically, Mm -hmm. got killed. So they say, this one thing happened. We've had these sites for years and years and years. One once. This one one thing happened. Let's get a review. I don't know Let's why hope this that thumbs the re- up thing it keeps coming. I have no idea what's going yeah, on. Neither. Let's hope this review gives us something that allows us to shut this down, is the subtext. Mm. The review comes out and says, oh, one of the reviews recommended keeping this location open as well as implementing better security plans and de-escalation training, while the other called for the overall expansion of supervised consumption services in the province. So they had a review specifically about that site. And then they had a review about the overall program. Hey, if we do two of them, one of them is likely to give us something. Mm. Both reviews gave them nothing. So then Ford government said his government is acting on, quote, public consultation, not just expert advice when it comes to this newly announced plan. The public being the people he wants to hear from that support his narrative. So he didn't get what he wanted out of those reports. Just like the... Our, Harper government 
asked the RCMP to do some type of study on this because they couldn't find any scientists that were willing mm -hmm. to do it. Because yeah. they knew that they wanted a report that would say something bad when he was looking at that. So the RCP did something and then found something. And that's what Harper ran on when he said that he wanted to close Insight. Mm -hmm. They manufacture their evidence here. Of course they do. And then you get this lovely one from Doug Ford. How would you feel if I stuck one of these beside your house? You wouldn't like it. Matter of fact, I know you wouldn't like it. Neither would your neighbors and neither will anyone else. And they shouldn't be by schools. They shouldn't be by daycares talking about a needle well doug ford i can tell you from personal experience because i've shared it on the show shortly after we moved in to this new home here at the beaver lodge mm -hmm. twice we found a needle in our laneway mm -hmm. and once we found a meth pipe on our lawn mm -hmm. where's the safe consumption site don't know right don't know. Aren't you guys close to a school? Uh, not within 200 meters. Oh, okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a high school that's a, a certain, maybe about 500 meters away. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's a school that's been closed. Oh, okay. Well, that's, isn't the water park? Yes, there's a water park. But again, that's probably, well, maybe that's about 200 meters. Yeah. Yeah. Two to so, 300 meters. Isn't yeah. that far? Yeah. The Culligan Water Park and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Memorial Center and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but... Here's the thing. Um, that happened within a space of a... We moved in in August. This happened sometime in October. We've never had an issue since. In the next three years. Yeah. So had we acted just on those three... Now, of course, we called someone to come and pick up the needle and dispose mm -hmm. of it. Accordingly. Appropriately yes. and accordingly. This, but after those three incidents, there has been nothing since. Had we reacted just on those, you need to do something. I didn't like it. No, I didn't like it. Think of the children. We were. Our extended family comes here. Mm -hmm. My niece and my nephew. At the time, three years younger, so um, seven and 12. Mm -hmm. I am sure that um, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law probably would have had different thoughts about uh, bringing the family over here if they knew we had that issue. We could have turned around and said, you know what? Yes, screw these things. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. I didn't like that we found the needles. But you know what I like even less? People dying. Yes. People who already have it tough. Not having a place to go. Mm -hmm. Dying alone. In some alleyway or behind mm -hmm. a building or behind a dumpster. That is not a dignified end to a life. No, it isn't. I like that even less. Call me a radical. I want people to get help. Mm -hmm. I want people to get help. I'm from the gay community. When HIV came along, and people are talking about putting condoms dispensers in high schools. Oh, that's just going to encourage kids to go and have sex. Yes, because kids would never have sex without a condom ever. <laughs> then we had putting sharps disposals in public bathrooms. Well, that's just going to encourage people to do. What, what about... Every time we propose something, I, I, as a member of the gay community, every time that we have proposed anything remotely harm reduction, Mm, there's always let's prevent pushback. kids mm. from picking up HIV or hepatitis mm. C. Mm -hmm. Let's stop people who are going to raves from mixing drugs that will kill them on the spot. Let's tell them what the chemistry of these things are so that they don't mix things that go together, mm -hmm. that don't go together. Because we have people are going to do drugs anyway. 
right? That's going to happen. That's what we're so that's why we did that for rave culture. So we're going to do it for rave culture because, well, these kids go back to their homes in the suburb, but we're not going to do it on the street because, well, they happen to be missing a few teeth and their, their clothes are tattered. We need to stop giving value to people depending on whether or not we like them or we want to see them, whether or not they push our ick button or they make us feel uneasy or uncomfortable. Again, everybody has value. Equal value. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't see it that way, though. This, this current crop of, of Reform Party stalwarts, including Doug Ford, who's not a reformer, but he's just motivated by money. They don't see value in, in those lives. And, and, and the irony, of course, being Doug used to be a hash dealer. That's a fact. It's been written about in the Toronto Star. It was well-researched, corroborated, authenticated, validated. They tried to sue, and they realized they couldn't. No lawsuit was ever brought forth. He threatened to sue, but the tor tour star said, sorry, you can't. It's true. Yep. Sworn affidavits. Yep. Quote, we're going to put more money in for these heart hubs that are going to support people the right way. Not give them a free place where all the drug dealers live in. Drug dealers don't live in safe conception sites. No, they don't. Ford said he's received endless, endless calls on his phone from people in Leslieville thanking him for imposing the ban on that community supervised conservation service, adding his government's plan is to support people with, quote, issues and addictions better than ever before. That's what we need to do. There's no place for this, he said. Uh, Doug, um, how about your endless and endless calls from uh, families of addicts? Families of people who have lost. Mm -hmm. People they love or are very much fearing losing people they love. Because right now they're still alive, that they know of. That's if they've heard from them in the last few months. If, big if. Doug, how about, how about those phone calls? Do you, do you get endless and endless phone calls from them thanking you for having done that, Doug? Because only for some people, right, Doug? Right. Supervised consumption site supporters, meanwhile, are saying that shuttering these sites will only exacerbate the problem and will achieve the opposite of the intended outcome, with people using drugs in parks and other public places more than ever before, not to mention more overdose deaths and drug-related injuries. What does Doug say? Well, those are just typical scare tactics that these folks have been saying for years and has not worked. Really? 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 Because there haven't been more and more people dying. Yeah. Right? The statistics are not showing that this, this is just fear mongering. Right? If you take away the place where they can do it safely, again, where do the overdoses go? Mm -hmm. As was asked. Where do the overdoses go, Doug? ER. They're not going to disappear. They're going to go to our overcrowded ERs. It's not going to reduce consumption. It's just going to happen in other places. They just move. If the they can't along. get clean needles, and if they can't even drop off the needles, the needles are going to go somewhere. Once you take the hit, and you're high, the ability to think clearly about what it is that you're going to do with the needle. Right? Once you've already had that, your 12th drink, you're not making the best decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Not particularly caring about what the people around you are going to think or how they're going to feel by the fact that you left broken beer bottles all over the, the street. So you really do expect people who are addicts when they've gotten their fix and they're high to think, oh yeah, maybe I should carefully dispose of my needle. <laughs> this is, all these things are going to go somewhere. Of course they are. It's a failed policy, simple as that. 
we're making better policy. Consulting with no one. 378 million to help these people, support them, get them help, get them back on their feet. These people. Of course. Right. Get them back on their feet, get them a good paying job. That's what we need to do. We don't need to feed them drugs. Yeah, but before you can do all of that, you got, they have to be at a spot where they want to get off the drugs. There's nothing wrong with these heart centers. There's nothing wrong with extra beds for treatment. But why can't these centers have a safe conception or a needle exchange or a needle drop off? There's no reason they can't other than you don't want them to. He said the best approach is to move forward and support them with detox beds. Mayors across the province are applauding this decision. Communities are applauding it. It's the right decision. We're going to support these people and get them back on the feet. He just can't say addicts, can he? Apparently not. <sighs> All right. Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed. Kits and Cups. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is carrying a word of mouth as prices, so please tell your peeps and poops all about us. If you would like to support us, well, you can, thanks to the Ray Girl. Thanks to her, who has sponsored our pod page, you do not have to miss an episode. Once we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. So just scan that QR code that appeared under my chin or use those lovely digits on those lovely hands to go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. Or you can use your voice prompt to do that as well. If you would like to help us in yet another way, make like Kit Elaine and surf on down to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page, and there you will find our buttons. We want you to loosen them up. Arr. Like, share, subscribe, click on them. We get happy, you get happy. It's win-win. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. And if you would like to help us in yet another way, the QR code that's appeared right there by Mr. Grizzly's head, well, that will bring you to our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there's where you will find our tip jar. So uh, if you want to support us, encourage us to do more, help us uh, offset the costs of producing this for you because we do offer it to you for free. Hey, we appreciate all the help that you can get. Thank you so very much. But if you can't help or you're not in a position to, don't worry because the gift of your attention and your participation are the ones we cherish the most. And we love to hear from you. So please write to us, truenorthegerbeaver at gmail.com. Reach us on our Twitter feed at True Eager, our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver, or leave us some comments on our YouTube page. We do read everything, kids and cubs. And we thank you for everything that you do to help to make this show better. And, and a lot of you have been giving us very positive word of mouth on social media lately. Thank you. Thank you. It's the best advertising we, we can't buy. We do we have uh, this little function you see on the screen right now. Join. Ooh. You can join the channel. And there are Ooh. tiers. Ooh. Oh, my. So there's loyalty member at $3.99 a month, executive member at $8.99 a month, and VIP member at $19.99 a month. Oh, my. Yeah, $19.99. So uh, we are going to start producing additional content for memberships uh, that will only be available to memberships, much like uh, um, OnlyFans does. Mm. Not, we're not producing pornography, okay? There's no nudity. It's still YouTube. No beaver showing the beaver? Oh. Okay. <laughs> My mom always said no nudity. Well, unless it was artfully done. But we, will produce, <laughs> we will start to uh, produce shorts and clips and additional content for you on that channel. And, uh, you know, just, just, just little extra tidbits for those who have been kind enough to uh, join for $3.99 a month. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There you go. All right, <laughs> Kid Chen, I was the condom dispenser in my high school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also lived at Dental Dams for literature. Ah, uh, lovely, lovely. All right. Um, because democracy is something that you do. Um, yeah, why not? Uh, if you live in Ontario, uh, take a tip uh, from Kit to Dan. Um, call your MPP, particularly if they happen to be conservative, and call the premier, mm-hmm. call the minister, and uh, let them know that, uh, yeah, all these uh, phone calls that you've been getting, well, here's some more. Yes. Smarten up. We don't consent. We do not consent on you trying to win an election on the backs of addicts. Yeah. Maybe. All right. And of course, all the by election stuff that you, you know about. From the Beaver Lodge, this is Yogi Beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom, please? We need some today. Yeah, you should really take your dog out before you start your show. <laughs> <laughs> I got to take her out like right now. I got to go. All right. See you. Bye, everyone. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. <laughs>